I, I certainly wasn't going to miss coming in to introduce Judy because that she's one of my all-time favorite authors at Politics and Prose. And I was uh, just telling her that last night I was reading uh, one of her poems. This is, uh, well, first of all, I, let me say, it was, if you can believe it, it was almost 50 years ago that Judy wrote It's Hard to Be Hip and Other Tragedies of Married Life. Now, 50 years later, here's another book about married life, Wait for Me, The Irritations and Consolation of a Long Marriage. Uh, last night I was reading one of her poems. It was in the first section, which is titled Irritations, and it's called Only Trying to Help. And uh, I came upon, uh, first of all, I came uh, upon a line that said, please know, what I, please know I mean well with every chastising word I speak. <laughs> and then a couple of lines later, with always the best of intentions, we've never refrained from our earnest intentions to constantly upgrade our mate. <laughs> and then um, I thought, well, that just rings a bell someplace. And I thought, I've just been reading something like that. And so I picked up a book that I had just put down that was a, a new biography of uh, Clementine Churchill. Um, and actually the author is coming this Tuesday night. And I had just read in there about a dinner party that uh, the Churchills were having, and this was after 50 years of marriage. And uh, Churchill had said to his wife, you will not be angry with me, dear, but you ought not to say very delicious. Delicious alone expresses everything you wish to say. <laughs> So it's a common affliction, uh, as, you, as you can uh, see. Uh, I feel very strongly that over the course of her life, Judy has become a marriage expert. Uh, after one brief early marriage, uh, she married Milton Viorst. Uh, experience since has taught her when to fold them and when to hold them. And she and Milton have now been holding for over 50 years with three children seven grand and seven grandchildren. Um, in 2001, Judy wrote a book called The Grown-Up Marriage, What We Know, Wish We Had Known, and Still Need, still need to Know About Being Married. Publishers Weekly praised her for writing like a plain speaking veteran. Uh, in one recent online interview that I watched, Judy says, a good marriage requires first Dumb luck, um, a huge amount of hard work and goodwill, and the willingness to laugh. Uh, incidentally, she adds that uh, for almost everything in her life that she has laughed about, she has also cried about. Um, Judy has now written some 37 books for both adults and children, uh, including whatever that you want, Judy can write it, children's books, adult books, poetry, uh, grieving books, consolation books, understanding books. Uh, she has a, uh, a long list of talents in every direction. And in her latest blossoming, um, this is after that she uh, turned 80, she wrote the lyrics for the musical rendition of Lulu and the Brontosaurus at the Imagination Stage in Bethesda. Incidentally, President Obama and his daughters bought the book, uh, Lulu and the Brontosaurus, when they were here on their shopping expedition. So we've got Lulu in the White House and Judy at Politics and Prose. So, uh, um, I, one more thing, I couldn't help but write Judy a note that after I had taken my granddaughter to see Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. This is a movie the Washington Post called A Hoot from Start to Finish. Um, and I wrote a note to Judy to tell her that here we were in a 
uh, at a matinee at a theater in Falls Church, Virginia. And at the end of the movie, the audience spontaneously broke into applause. And I just felt so happy that uh, I felt so proud for Judy and so happy that I had seen her career blossom so much over the years. So here's Judy to talk about Wait For Me and read some of her poems. Thank you, Barbara. I love that. Um, and thank all of you, all of you, for being here today. There are a lot of you in this room who have been my steadfast fellow travelers as I've written my way through the decades from uh, 20 to 80, all of us getting older and older, faster and faster. Um, so here we are now in various states of intactness or semi-intactness. Um, ready to consider the ups and downs, the irritations and consolations of a long marriage. Um, Wait for me, this new book of poems looks quite different from all of my other collections because this time each of the poems in the book has been illustrated with charming full color paintings by a terrifically talented artist named Stephen Campbell, who I would like to note has made the wife in his pictures a blonde, so she can't possibly be confused with me. And wait for me, I'm looking at those late life marital years when we constantly misplace our car keys and sometimes our car, when a good night's sleep means just getting up twice to pee, when our kids are telling us sell the house and stop driving, when to placate the kids, we've now installed grab bars in the bathroom and railing so we won't fall down the stairs. And we, re we recognize that all the low-fat diets in the world won't make us immortal. I'm looking at those marital years when we finally, finally aged out of colonoscopies, but acquired in their place a whole new collection of ailments, infirmities, and specialists. I'm looking at those years when anniversary, birthday, and holiday celebrations now happen at brunch or lunch instead of dinner because it has become quite clear that everyone, everyone is better off if we don't get behind the wheel of the car after dark. I'm also looking at those years when <coughs> we learn that marriage can become better over time with the consolations more or less outweighing the irritations. Now, I hadn't known that Disraeli had some opinions to offer on marriage, but it turns out he does. Here's what he says. It destroys one's nerves to be amiable every day to the same human being. <laughs> I get that. Well, I have known a long, lot of long-term marriages um, that uh, have gotten on each other's nerves plenty, and only a very few who seem to have sailed through the years not driving each other nuts at all. Um, um, as, as Barbara pointed out, these are the marriages, I believe, um, began as the product of just plain dumb luck. Because young lovers can't possibly understand in the heat of initial passion, what they're going to do with each other, how they're going to relate to each other, how they're going to handle what life throws at them over the decades. And they certainly do not imagine that there will come a time when they will be thinking some really um, <coughs> unfriendly thoughts. And I'm quoting actual people here like, uh, maybe this was a terrible mistake, or oh my god, I think I married my mother. Or if, while I am talking to him, he clears his throat one more time, I am going to kill him. <laughs> the fact is they couldn't possibly have known what they'd signed on for when they'd signed on for it. So all I can say about them is they had lots of luck. The rest of us long-term marrieds um, learn from the beginning or um, very soon thereafter that there were certain traits in our mate that we were either going to have to try to change, and lots of luck with that one, 
or rise above, just not let it bother us. And as the years go by and he isn't changing and you aren't rising above, you begin to understand that these are the permanent irritants of a long marriage. This is the reality for most of, most of us. Now, it's been said that if a husband and wife can finish each other's sentences, it means they really, truly love each other. But after you've been married 40, 50, 60 years, it turns out that the reason you can't ever finish a sentence is because he is constantly interrupting you. <laughs> and while there's a, a certain contentment to be found in familiarity, um, long-time marrieds uh, may feel there's such a thing as too much familiarity, especially when he's telling that story or you are telling that joke over and over and over and over again. So interruptions and repetitions seem to be among the enduring irritations of a long marriage, and so do our continuing and always fruitless efforts to upgrade our mate, to help and correct and improve him. Here's a poem on the subject. Barbara read you a little bit of it. I'm going to read you the whole thing. It's called Only Trying to Help. I'm only trying to help when I observe that every tie that you wear, wear has been stained by food you have failed to transport to your mouth from your plate. And you're only trying to help when you tell me I've gained, along with a lifetime of wisdom, a bit too much weight. And when I complain that I'm tired of having to shriek because you insist that a hearing aid won't help you hear, please know I mean well with each chastising word that I speak into your left and your only viable ear. <laughs> And when you remind me of things I forgot to get done, like turning the eggs off and paying the telephone bill, and when I inform you of how many stop signs you've run, let's try to remember our hearts are suffused with goodwill. With always the best of intentions, we've never refrained from our earnest attempts to constantly upgrade our maid. And though there are times when our marital bonds have been strained by our unerring talent to mutually irritate, we find comfort in knowing we're only trying to help. So um, you can call that goodwill. I'm, go I'm calling it goodwill. And um, as Gloria Steinem put it, however, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> um, there is reason for irritation when a husband and wife can't agree on whether to sleep with the window open or closed or when a husband and wife hold highly, highly divergent views on whether you walk through the wind and the rain and the dark and the freezing cold for 15 expletive deleted minutes, or whether you park with the valet parking, which is right there in front of the restaurant. <laughs> and there is reason for irritation when, as this next poem describes in detail, a husband and wife do not share the same view about sharing. It's called Lines Composed While Packing to Go on Vacation. Although I'm exceedingly fair, I simply do not like to share a closet, a dresser drawer, or a bathroom shelf. But any time you'd like to count, you'll find the exact same amount of space that is yours and the space that I've kept for myself. It's a matter of personal pride that whenever I'm asked to divide a vegetable curry or a sashimi matsu, I will carefully calculate the portion I put on each plate so there isn't a drop more for me than there is for you. Yet in spite of all this, you still scowl when I don't want you using my towel or won't go along with two spoons and one creme caramel. There's a you and a me and an us. And the reason for all of this fuss is I have firm boundaries and yours are as porous as hell. <laughs> In a marriage, they're sharing enough without intermingling stuff like hairbrushes, house keys, the spray that you spray up your nose. <laughs> and equal but separate works fine as a way to keep what is mine, mine. So don't even ask if my suitcase has room for your clothes. <laughs> Or as the prophet Khalil Gibran wisely instructs us, let there be spaces in your togetherness. Drink not from one cup. Now, some of the issues I've mentioned so far could arise between a couple and even the early years of married life. 
But there are other irritations more specifically related to getting older and to getting old. His hearing is fading, but he won't wear a hearing aid, leaving her caught between his reproachful, I can't hear you, speak up. And when she speaks up, it's even more reproachful, why are you shouting at me? <laughs> her driving is not what it used to be, but of course, um, she's still driving the car, leading him to inquire in a tone she does not appreciate. Is there some special reason you're parking in the middle of the street rather than at the curb? <laughs> and though neither of them returning from the grocery store these days will bring home everything they were planning to buy, neither will make a list on the grounds that what? I need a list for three little items? You need a list. It is easy to irritate when there are so many age-related <laughs> suggestions and warnings that husbands and wives are tempted indeed believe it's their God-given duty to offer each other. But in spite of this, which could become an infinite sampling, um, there are some consolations to mitigate the irritations. For, for the same familiarity, which can be so irritating the 50 millionth time you've heard the joke, can also create in other circumstances um, that sense of ease and coziness and safety and, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes husbands and wives interrupt each other, not because they're being insensitive and impossibly narcissistic, which is most of the time, but because they're rushing in to say, I know what you mean. I know how you feel. I get it. And even the most territorial of spouses can truly take pleasure in the shared experiences of married life and learn that some of the spaces that are firmly guarding their separateness can be filled by a mutual and a mature dependency, just as long as he orders his own dessert and doesn't reach over and finish half of yours. Ecclesiastes has also weighed in on the consolations of marriage, reminding us, and I'm quoting chapter and verse, two are better than one, for if two lie together, they will keep each other warm but how can one keep warm alone? And here's a poem on that called, Like Two Ships That Pass in the Night. I have to find it. Like two ships that pass in the night, we pass each other on our way to the bathroom never pausing to say hello or to kiss. It is three, it is four, it is five o'clock in the morning, and how we wish that we could stop meeting like this. <laughs> Exhausted, shuffling, and barely able to see, driven from bed by the urgent need to pee. We are not at our boudoir best. You wear plaid pajamas while I sleep in t-shirts that say things like global warming, it's the truth. But no silks or satins or laces could help us recover the undisturbed slumbers of our long vanished youth. Too tired to linger and too tired to rush, we do what we came to do and remember to flush. <laughs> Awake yet again, we get up to head yet again to the same destination. I may be nod and you may be wave a hand. When we turned off the lights and lay down our heads on our pillows, these nocturnal rendezvous were not what we planned. But the sight of each other is a most comforting sight, like those ships, we're glad we're not alone in the night. I've noticed that many, many decades of married life um, encourage us in a spirit of gratitude. Gratitude for what we've got and um, gratitude for what we don't got. Not, not that I'm suggesting that husbands and wives have completely relinquished their God-given right to bitch and moan and complain or to think the occasional homicidal thought or to drive each other utterly, totally, and completely wild and I'm not necessarily talking about it in a good way. But still we are growing more grateful and though what annoys us will probably always annoy us, we may become, as this next poem suggests, accustomed. In addition to your face, I've grown accustomed to the cacophony of your snore <laughs> and your bony knees pressing into the small of my back 
and your toenail clippings adorning our tiled bathroom floor, and those crumbs in the kitchen revealing you just snuck a snack, and me tripping over your always unput away shoes and your desk, a nightmare, a criminal act, a disgrace, and your voice too loudly expressing contrarian views and your face, your baggy-eyed beloved face. There's one more poem I want to read from the uh, Consolations here before I move on to the Wait For Me poem. And this is a poem called Nice. In a world where there are children named Buster and Apple and nobody knows any Yettas anymore, it's nice to be married to someone the same age as I am. In a world wherever there's talk about folks who are famous and I haven't a clue as to what they're famous for, it's nice to be married to someone as clueless as I am. In a world where regular people have personal trainers and it takes a size zero to make a woman feel thin, it's nice that you are expanding as quickly as I am. In a world where bottled water is an accessory and plain old club soda preferred over something with gin, it's nice you're as unabstemious as I am. In a world where everyone's vegan or vegetarian or else has a list a mile long of what they don't eat, it's nice that you're as omnivorous as I am. In a world where virtual is the new reality and telephone booths are virtually obsolete, it's nice that you're every bit as unwired as I am. In a world where everyone's powering on and off, in a world where hacking doesn't refer to a cough, in a world where nothing on earth is too arcane for Google to instantaneously explain, and tattoos aren't only for thugs, but for the elite. It's nice you're as 20th century, as stubbornly 20th century, as hopelessly 20th century as I am. Now, um, the title poem and really the heart of my book is called Wait For Me. And the idea was improbably inspired by an article I read in The New Yorker um, a couple of years ago. The author, Jerome Groupman, describes the concerns of a little boy, a dying little boy, whose mother had promised to join him later in heaven, but who worries about how they're ever going to find each other in that vast, enormous, <laughs> infinite place. And so to ease these anxieties, the boy and his mom make a plan, agreeing that they will meet when she gets there, they'll meet in the front left corner of heaven. Well, from Groupman's touching story, I found myself bopping along, as writers frequently do, from one association to another, until the poignant notion of tr trying to find an otherworldly meeting place became my more playful than sorrowful wait for me. I imagined the husband and wife of these previous poems, this couple who'd reached a certain age, who indeed had reached well beyond that certain age, both of them in fairly good health, but still perhaps the time had come for some final arrangements. And so I began a series of haranguing, cajoling rhymes in which a determined wife is trying to have a let's decide where to meet in the afterlife chat with a very, and I mean very, resistant husband. So here's how she starts. So just in case there's a place we go when we die, and just in case you should get there before I do, I don't, when it's my turn, want to spend eternity looking for you. So let's decide where we'll meet. Let's decide where you'll wait for me. This is a woman who well in advance, um, say, 40 years ago, had doubtless already insisted that she and her husband sit down and draw up their wills and designate a power of attorney and fill out all those do not resuscitate forms. She had certainly insisted on purchasing pleasing, nicely located plots, making sure that each tomb was a tomb with a view. And she probably even selected something appropriate and witty to be carved whenever the time arrived on their stone. And maybe her husband had grumpily gone along with all this compulsive planning ahead, though mortal thoughts were not his favorite topic. But now she was going too far. She was going too far, and enough was enough. 
and he didn't have the slightest intention of indulging her silly request, who, as she repeatedly says to him, pick a place where you'll wait for me. She, however, will not be deterred. She is going to get him to settle with her on a meeting place, and so she keeps pressing verse after verse after verse, with Steve Campbell's illustrations conjuring up some delicious other world possibilities, the Cosmos Cafe that's been serving the public since always, or maybe a flower-filled upper celestial meadow, or maybe a site where a hot air balloon sponsored by heavenly tours would be awaiting them. Can't she persuade him to just pick one of these places? She reminds her recalcitrant husband that she has always had a terrible sense of direction and gets confused whenever she goes someplace new, which means she complainingly tells him that I could be wandering through infinity looking for you, so let's choose a simple location where you will wait for me. And then because she is thinking that he might be finding the subject a little negative, she hastens to assure him that it's not. This isn't to say that our final days are impending. It's just that I want to cross a few things off my list. And one of these things is our inescapable ending, which each time I bring up the subject, you always resist. So no, I'm not going all dark and gloomy and Russian. I just, you know, don't like leaving matters to chance. And that's why I want to embark on a brief discussion of where we'll be dancing after our closing dance. Her husband has no interest in embarking on any discussion, no matter how brief. Hiding behind the coffee and the newspaper, turning on the TV to check on the weather, shifting the subject to climate change and world peace, and to her vast annoying suggesting she, why doesn't you just try to live in the moment instead? This is not a woman who lives in the moment instead, when future unresolved issues must be resolved. Issues that aren't being resolved because, as she suggests, her husband appears to be in a state of denial. And another reason you hate this conversation is because you think all those treadmill miles you tread will save you along with your morning oatmeal from ever being dead. Well, they won't, and you will. So pick a place where you'll wait for me. And now her husband's refusal to engage in this pre-mortem chat makes her start questioning their entire relationship. If this wait for me issue isn't as urgent to him as it is to her, Maybe this is evidence that they are fundamentally incompatible. There have been, after all, so many things that they haven't agreed about over the years. It makes her wonder, how has this marriage endured? It is more than surprising. You are a last minute person. I am a first. I need a schedule. You much prefer improvising and hope without fail for the best while I gird for the worst. But she would argue her girding for the worst makes lots more sense than is hoping for the best, especially at this time of life when they're not just growing older, they've grown old. So if she tries to remind him that they won't be living forever, this isn't simply because she's got a bad attitude. She puts it like this. We still enjoy holding hands when we're watching a movie. We still enjoy holding hands when we walk down the street. And though it's been decades since we've aspired to groovy, we're not quite prepared for a look at them, aren't they sweet? But what with the acid reflux and spinal stenosis and completely forgetting last evening's dinner date, don't tell me that I am suffering from a neurosis if I say we're in a somewhat diminished state. A diminished state which includes, she goes on to remind him, spending obscene amounts of time frantically searching for eyeglasses and house keys which is further proof, she suggests, that they not only need to pick out a place where they'll meet, but they better write it down or they'll forget where it is. <laughs> but now she has a terrible thought, a thought that hadn't crossed her mind before, a thought that is suddenly sounding chillingly plausible. Maybe her husband's refusal um, to engage in this discussion is not because he's being immature and unrealistic and uncooperative, Maybe it's because she's not the woman he wants to be spending eternity with. <laughs> Maybe he'd be more responsive if some other woman, some alluring younger woman, seductively asked him to pick a place. Will you wait for me? And the next illustration in, in the book shows a lineup of several quite adorable women, all of them vying to be her husband's preferred choice. It's very upsetting. But then her moment of panic subsides. She regroups and starts arguing on her own behalf. 
making a strong case for why it is she who ought to be her husband's first choice. We've been through, I told you it wasn't worth all that money. We've been through for once in your life, admit you're wrong. We've been through, you actually thought that movie was funny. But more often than not, we find that we sing the same song. And most of the time, what's good overrides aggravation. And so far, we've somehow escaped some really close calls, suggesting we're in this together for a duration that could continue long after the curtain falls. And then one final verse from her, delivered this last time, not insistently, not annoyingly, not haranguingly, but with the tender regard of an old, old love. Do we believe in heaven? I don't think so. In fact, we probably don't. And yet, and yet, how could it possibly hurt to hedge this bet? Come closer, my darling, and we'll decide where you'll wait for me. So this book ends with the husband and wife cuddled together cozily on a cloud. It's clear they don't plan to relocate anytime soon. Now that eternity is settled, now that she's crossed that off her list, she can turn her full attention to tomorrow, to getting some bids for that paint job for the kitchen, to buying replacements for those frayed bathroom towels, to signing up for next year's ballet series, and to enjoying the more than sufficient consolations that outweigh the irritations of a long marriage. Thank you. <laughs>